This week, as, as we as a team were preparing for this morning, a uh, discussion came up about keeping our worship fresh, keeping our worship focused on Jesus. Um, and the answer to the question is that we can't. We have to rely on Jesus. We have to rely on his mercy and his grace. And the song that we're going to open with this morning, Come Thou Fount, it says, Come Thou Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. And so this morning, I want us to sing it together so that we can fully focus on Jesus and who he is. Uh, another part of the song says that I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. We're so, it's so easy for us to look around, to see all the different things, but we need to come back to Jesus. We need to come back to who he is. And it says, let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. So as we focus on who he is and what he's done, he will bring us back to where he is. So let's sing that together this morning. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger. Wandering from the fold of God, He to rescue me from danger, interposed His precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily. Thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to Thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and see. you have redeemed us and that we can stand here in your freedom we praise you Kimberly would you lead us
knows what living is. He's acquainted with the grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Oh, blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who
glorify the name of Jesus. We give you glory and honor. All the praise that you deserve, Lord Jesus. We offer you.
My name is Jacoby. Our scripture reading for today is from Hebrews 12, 1 through 17. Therefore, since we are all surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sin such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have endured. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who discipline us, and we, we respect them. Shall we not much more be subjugate, subject to the Father of the Spirit and live? For they discipline us for a short time, as it seems, seems best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For this moment, for the moment, all disciples seem, discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields a peaceful, peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who, whom have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and and by it many become defiled that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that, afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he had found no chance to repent. Though he sought it with tears, you may be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Tommy Knauts. I am the youth and family pastor here, and it is my privilege to be able to continue in this series with you this morning. Uh, But before we jump in, I just wanted to say a quick update for our student ministries, Uh, because a lot of you have asked over the last few years, as I've transferred out of worship ministry, what has it been like jumping into youth and family? And I just want to tell you all that I absolutely love it. Uh, I really believe that God is something, doing something powerful in this generation. Uh, we've been having an average of about 120 students every Wednesday night, and so it's been really incredible. Yeah. And I really, I couldn't do it without my leaders, and so uh, a shameless plug, a thank you to all my leaders because uh, they really make it run every Wednesday. And in that, even one of my leaders texted me this week, and he just said, hey, uh, I just wanted you to know that I was in school today with a student, and they came up to me, and they just said, I love youth group. I have always uh, despised church, never wanted to be a part of it, and I look forward to every Wednesday coming and, and hearing about God and being a part of it. And so it really is cool to see that the way that God is working, and I feel very privileged to be a part of it. And so keep sending your children. Keep sending your students. I love it. Uh, there's a few in fourth grade that I'm terrified to get in a couple years, but uh, no, I'm really I'm looking forward to it. And so... Um, but like I said, my name is Tommy Knauts. Uh, my wife and I, Allison, we are approaching eight years of marriage this June. Thank you. 
Uh, there's a couple in pre-service meeting who are at 45, so we have a long ways to go still, and so that's pretty incredible. But my daughter, Ivy, she's six. Uh, my son, Grayson, is four, and we are having a baby boy this July whose name will be Parker, and so we are really excited to meet him. Uh, but my daughter, Ivy, she's really into handstands right now, and don't, don't misunderstand me. She's into the idea of handstands because she can't actually do one. So she looks at my wife or I, and she goes, hey, can you just hold my legs while I put my arms out? And that's her handstand, right? So I'm like literally holding her. She's dangling and putting her hands on the ground, and she's calling that her handstand. So my wife and I are like, okay, we probably should start getting her in some gymnastics classes because neither of us are qualified to train her in this. If you've taken one look at me, you know that I'm not going to be doing handstands uh, and teaching her how to do it. And so, oh, actually, you know, it's funny when you think about the way that you look doing something. Uh, have you ever been in a place where you're like, okay, I, I'm really good at this, and then someone shows you a video and you're like, oh, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> For instance, I thought I was really good at cartwheels, and my wife was like, have you ever seen yourself doing a cartwheel? In my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm going perfectly straight. My arms are extended. My legs are up, right? No, it's really an awkward somersault. She showed me a video. I'm going to spare you, really spare myself the embarrassment. Uh, but it is like this really just, it doesn't go well. So anyway, we're looking at gym- gym- gymnastics lessons for my daughter. Uh, but in that, we decided in the meantime, okay, we could find some videos on YouTube of like basic gymnastics. And so my daughter got really excited. She's like, yes, let's watch it. So we put it on. 30 seconds in, she goes, can you fast forward to the handstand? We're like, Ivy, you need to understand the basics before you can just jump into the handstand. She's like, well, I don't, I don't want to do this. I want the handstand. And so 30 seconds later, she's like, I'm all done. I'm like, okay. So then she turns to me, guess what she goes, can we do a handstand, right? So then she's back up, like putting her legs in my hands, and I'm holding her back up. I'm like, we're back to where we were. And so if any of you teach gymnastics, come talk to me afterwards. But why am I talking about gymnastics when we're talking about Hebrews 12? Well, because I think there's such a correlation here between instant gratification. And I wonder how many of us can relate to this idea. Maybe it's not a handstand, but maybe it's that next job promotion, Maybe it's that new house you've been wanting or a new car or finally since we're heading into warmer weeks, it's that new boat. Maybe it's that new piece of technology, right? We live in a society where you can get things primed next day shipping, right? Amazon Prime, next day it's here to you. There's no waiting for anything anymore. There's this instant gratification. And so just like my daughter who is wanting to do this handstand, I think there's a lot of us who are looking for things to happen instantly in our lives, And so in the same way that I'm trying to help her understand the importance of waiting and learning, the author of Hebrews is also letting us know that to go through life well, to run the race with endurance, we're going to have to experience some waiting even if we don't want to. So we're going to jump in. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews 12. If you need one, just throw your hand in the air and one of the ushers can get one of them to you. Let me pray as we jump into God's word together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in your word, to be here. And God, I just pray that you continue to shape us, grow us, and mold us to be more like you. God, as as we look at Hebrews 12, that you speak through me in a way that people can understand how to best run the race with endurance. God, we love you, and we pray that we leave here a little more like you. In your name I pray. Amen. So there's this idea of waiting through discipline. The author of Hebrews starts off by talking about running this race. And then it quickly shifts into how we're going to experience hardships and discipline. The Christian life does not promise to be one that can be run with ease. And C.S. Lewis, an author, says this, that God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to arouse a deaf world. It is his megaphone to arouse a deaf world. Starting in verse 2 of chapter 12, it says this, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. 
The author here is acknowledging that, hey, we're going to go through hardships. We're going to go through pain. We're going to go through discipline. But when we go through those things, we're following after a God who has already gone before us. As followers of Jesus, we look to the author and perfecter of our faith who came before, who suffered and died on a cross after living a perfect life. That whatever we're going through, there's already hope in what he's saying, that whatever we're going through, we can follow after a God who's already gone before us, who's already suffered in ways that we can't even imagine. Pastor Carl talked about this last week, and he said, faith isn't the absence of hardship, but it's the presence of God. Back in Hebrews 5, 8, it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Talking about Jesus. Jesus learned obedience while he was fully man through what he suffered. So the question asked is, is discipline a punishment? Is what the author here talking about with discipline, is this a punishment? And I would answer no. It is not a punishment, but it is a byproduct of sin. I would argue that it is used to help us learn obedience, just like chapter 5 talks about. Jesus' sufferings forever altered the nature of our suffering by what he did on the cross. Because he took on the weight, the punishment of sin for all humanity for all of time. And so as we suffer, as we have discipline, as we have trials, it is now refining us into Christ's holiness. Trying to get Ivy, my daughter, to understand the discipline of learning basics is only going to be for her good. It's only going to help her in her pursuit of gymnastics. But at such a young age, it's such a hard concept for her to grab, right? She's like, the basics, this sounds boring. This is hard. I don't want to do those things. And we can look at her and be like, it's really not that big of a deal. But you translate it to things that we've been going through, right? Some of us have experienced real hardship, real pain, real suffering. You've lost loved ones. You've lost jobs. You're battling sickness or depression or anxiousness. You've been through divorce. So when the author talks about these things being for our good, how do we understand what he's actually meaning? Because when we're going through pain, I don't, if you're like me, it hurts. And it's not something that I'm like, oh, thank you, God. This feels really good. I'm really excited to see how you're using this for my good. But yet, that is exactly what the author here is saying, is that all pain, when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, is for our good. Verses 10 and 11 say this, For they disciplined us for a short time, talking about our earthly father, as it seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The pain that you go through isn't diminished. We're allowed to experience pain. We're going to feel that grip when we go through hardships. But there's hope in the fact that it's temporary. There's hope in the fact that we worship a God who's gone before and is still working in our lives, in our situations. We have choices to make in the midst of pain. We can either have faith and trust and know that God is working in the midst of it, even when we don't see it, or we can decide, you know what, I'm done. We can turn our back on God and we can just, it's too much, I'm done. When we are right with God, when we are pursuing after God, he starts to make us righteous. We start to become more holy like he is holy. And that's what the author means. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter and founder, through those trials, through those hardships, there is this change in our spirit where we become more 
holy like Christ is. We become more righteous like Christ is. And in that is how it is for our good. Discomfort, hardships, trials, born for the sake of Christ, and we're following after Jesus, are and should be viewed as privileges and blessings, which is a hard thing to say and believe. Why? Why should we count it as a privilege and a blessing? Well, if we go back to verse 7, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Discipline is not a sign of displeasure. It's not a sign of God's displeasure in us. Rather, it's a sign that he cherishes us as his children. That as we walk through hardships, as we walk through disciplines, God is using that to refine us and make us more holy like him, to become worthy heirs to the throne. My job as Ivy's father, is to help her understand that getting through the basics, the disciplines, are only going to set her up for not just handstands, but, but other things that she might be interested in. Like, she's really into the monkey bars. It'll help her be better at the monkey bars. It'll help her be better at cartwheels, which I won't be, but it'll help her be better at somersaults. All those things, right, that come with learning the basics of gymnastics, she will understand a bit better. And that is what the author is encouraging us to do on a different level, is to understand how God is working in the midst of our situations. When we keep our eyes fixed on him, that something far better than we can fathom or imagine is going to happen. But we only see the temporary in that moment. Sometimes we get stuck, we get fixated on the pain. And yet, the author is calling us to run while waiting. There's kind of this shift here in verses 12 and 13. Therefore, the author says. So we've gone through this moment, right? We're talking about hardships and what it looks like and how we are supposed to follow Jesus' example through hardships and how it is used to refine us and make us holy and righteous and all these things. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. There's this shift now where, okay, we've been told how to get through this. And so because of this, we now have the spiritual ability through our Heavenly Father to lift our drooping arms, to fix our weak knees, to allow us to run while we're waiting, even when it feels like we can barely move. In those moments of pain and suffering, when it feels like we're barely above water, when we do it in a way that can honor Christ, he is promising that he will give us the ability to run. Because he also, through this author, tells us that we're not running the race alone. I don't know if you've ever thought, if any of you are enjoy hiking or really thought about a hiking trail, but they're windy. They're not a straight path. I mean, even roads, really, like you're not on a straight path for very long before it winds. But when you're hiking, it's often gravel or dirt or whatever, and right, there's often debris, like trees fall over, you got to hop over them, or there's rocks, or there's just things in your way, obstacles that you have to go around. And in, in verse 13 here, We are supposed to make straight paths for your feet. What the author here is saying is that as you do these things, as you fix your weary knees, as you fix your drooping arms, as you start to run, God will make your paths straight so that you can not only run by yourself, but you can lead others along that path with you. You can bring somebody else who's going through trials or hardships and say, hey, come on, I've already done this. Like, we're going to go through this together. Because the flip side of that is if we don't, we're continuing to make windy paths not only for us but for each other. Why? So that we can strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's verse 14. We are challenged by the 
author to build ourselves up first. It's kind of like that same idea with the airplane, right? They tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself, and then you can put it on the person next to you. The author is saying, okay, get yourself running. Get yourself in a place where you can endure through the pain and the hardships, and then you can help the person next to you. Why? So that we can live at peace with all men. There is a direct parallel in Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with those you like, with those you share popular opinion. No, live peaceably with all. So if our job is to live peaceably with all, as far as it depends on you, are you putting the work in? Because just like anything, when you have to train for something, there is work involved. Why? Because holiness is on the line. Going back to verse 10, the author tells us that these trials will help us share in Christ's holiness. And right now the author is warning us that if we don't live at peace with each other, we're sacrificing the ability to share in God's holiness together. If we continue to practice this reckoning of ourselves as righteous through Jesus, we will find ourselves much more motivated to live righteously. But then there's kind of this interesting twist here. At least I think it's interesting. Verses 16 and 17, it says that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Now, in the last chapter, we have this whole list of spiritual heroes, Esau is not listed there. Then we get to this part, and all of a sudden it's like Esau seems to be shamed. And I always thought Esau was just tricked a bunch. Like, I always felt bad for Esau, right? I'm like, his brother Jacob is just, he keeps tricking him and deceiving him. So what, why are we all of a sudden looking at Esau as this bad character? So if you have your Bible, go back to Genesis chapter 25. Because it's important for us to go back to Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 29, to understand the story of Esau a little bit better. It says this, starting in verse 29. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Again, we're reading this, and we're like, okay, yeah, Esau, it seems like he was tricked. So we got to dive a bit deeper into the text to understand all that is going on here. Esau traded his birthright. Now, in Jewish culture, your birthright as firstborn is to inherit. Inherit what your father has already started, like their legacy, like you're taking it on. And if we go back, we know that God has promised Abraham many descendants, right? We know that God made many promises that he was going to do things through Abraham's line. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn. And in that moment, Esau is either saying, I don't believe these promises to be true, so just take my birthright, or... He doesn't care. This is my own interpretation, but I started reading this in a different way. I started thinking about my kids, and after I just fed them lunch, about an hour later, Dad, I'm so hungry. Dad, can I just have a snack? It's always about a snack. I don't know why. I I start calling meals snacks just so they eat them. It's like, can I have a snack? I'm so hungry. So I started thinking about this. I'm like, what if this is how Esau was? 
Oh, I've been working all day. I'm so hungry. Jacob, you're cooking. It smells so good. Just give me a bowl. I just need one. I'm starving. I'm going to die if you don't give me a bowl, right? It starts to change the way that we see this story a little bit because you're like, okay, so if that was his attitude, was he really about to die? Was he really that hungry? Or did he just in a moment want some instant gratification? And I think he just wanted to fill his belly. He'd been working all day. He's hungry. And so in that moment, all he saw was that bowl of stew. And just like that, he gave up the promises that God had for him to have a bowl of stew. I'm calling today's message in the last point, hungry, why wait? Because Esau didn't wait. He was hungry, so he ate. And I believe the author ends this section with this because it's so important for us to understand as followers of Jesus and what ways are we acting like Esau in our lives. Esau had a secular mentality, a mentality that had little time for worship or service, but was intent upon material gain and earthly advantage. Professing Christians who claim to be born again but live no differently than non-Christians are repeating the same godlessness as Esau. Matthew 7, 23, Jesus says, Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. That's what's at risk. Is Jesus looking at us and saying, I never knew you. The New Testament emphasizes that spiritual repentance is possible for those who desire it. So did Esau desire repentance? When we look at the end here, it said he had found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So Esau, later on, he goes before his dad. He goes before Isaac, and he's like, Dad, give me the blessing. Give me the blessing that is is promised to me. And his dad's like, uh, I thought I already did. Because Jacob had come in, deceived him to get it. But in that moment, Jacob kind of had earned it by taking it from his brother for the stew. But now Esau's like, well, you got you to have some blessing for me. He's like, I, I, I gave it to your brother. And in that moment, like a pouting child... Esau cries. It's not out of a place of repentance. Like, oh, I messed up. It was like, I didn't get what I wanted, and so now I'm going to cry. And so that's what the author means, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. God always forgives. But the warning here is that the pursuit of the world is going to leave us feeling numb to that forgiveness or, worse yet, numb to that relationship with God. The band, if you want to come up, will be wrapping up in a minute. And so we're called to run this race. We're called to run this race with patience, pursuing peace and holiness. So the question I have for us this morning, for myself, is... Where and how are we like Esau? I think, I don't know, but I I would imagine that Esau had other moments leading up to this decision in his life. Other moments where he kind of just disregarded his faith in God that led to this bigger moment here. I'd be curious to know more about his life and, and the decisions that he made and the way that maybe he flippantly regarded his relationship with God. What little ways do we do that? That maybe we don't even realize, but we're giving in to the things of this world that as Matthew 6, 19 says, do not lay 
up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, right? Everything in this world is going to fade. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have things. You can't have nice things. Of course you can. But it's a matter of our heart, our posture of our heart. And obviously there was something in Esau's heart that was making him drift farther and farther from his relationship with God. So what are the little things in our life that we're sacrificing that when it comes to those trials, those disciplines, those hardships, we're going to have a harder time walking through? Because I don't know about you, but when there are hardships, those are the moments where I feel like at my most depleted. And if we don't have God to fall back on, we're not going to respond with peace and with patience and with love and with understanding because we're hurting. And yet that is what we are supposed to do. So where in our lives are we sacrificing things of this world to further our relationship with God, to strengthen our relationship so that we can be more holy, we can be more righteous? I like the idea of starting my day off with reading the Bible and praying. I also love sleeping. And so there's a handful of times where I'm like, oh, kids were up. I'll, I just need that extra half hour. I'll get to my Bible at some point today. In that moment, the idea of sleeping seems awesome. But I'm sacrificing without even realizing it something consistent, something that will continue to help me grow spiritually, to strengthen me spiritually. We're not running this race alone, but you do need to get yourself put together. You need to get yourself running before you can help the person next to you run got to get the oxygen mask on yourself first. So what do you need to give up? What do you need to lay aside? What disciplines do you need to start doing so that you can better be ready for the hardships when they come? Do you believe that Christ is enough? We're going to end and we're going to sing this song. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. And I think a lot of times we sing songs in church and maybe we sing because we're there. We're in that spot. We're like, yep, I believe it. I'm ready to go. I'm running. Maybe sometimes we sing because, well, there's people singing next to us. So I got to sing these words. Maybe sometimes we look at the screen and we're like, you know what? I know that's true, but I'm going to have a hard time believing it right now. I I know Christ is enough, but man, what I'm going through is so difficult. I'm having a hard time, and I, I need Christ to show me. So when we sing, we sing this chorus together. This is my challenge as we head into this worship moment. That as you sing those words, Christ is enough for me, whether you're in the place to truly believe it or you are in that place, I want us to lift our hands together as a sign of surrender. I know sometimes raising your hand in church feels awkward, but it's an opportunity for us in this moment to show each other that we're running this race together. Because I tell you what, when we are all running the race and we are doing it together, that is when we are going to see Christ show up in powerful ways, that we are going to see heaven on earth. We're going to see glimpses of what heaven will look like when we are all running that race together, when we can put aside our differences and our opinions and whatever else we might be struggling with, because we recognize, you know what, no matter what, that they're my brother and they're my sister. And we are meant to run this race together. So how can I bring them along? How can I take them down my path that is straight? So would you stand with me? And as Pastor Drew leads us, 
I would say whether you're comfortable or not, my challenge would be to lift your hands as we sing this chorus, surrendering that Christ is enough no matter what we're going through. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. And everything I need is in you. And everything I need. Let's lift it up. We sing. And Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I sometimes in our worship you know we can be so focused personally 
this is, this is that time where we corporately are singing in one voice together, where the sum is greater than the parts. We have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. This is Community Church Oshkosh saying we have decided to follow Jesus. All right, in one voice, let's lift this up. Two, three, we sing. We have decided. No turning back, no turning back. We have this. No turning back, no turning back. You're not alone, because we have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Shout it! No turning back. No, one more time. I want all the men in the room to sing that octave. We have this. No turning back. Come on, every voice. No turning back. We say, We have this. No turning back, no turning back, hey! Woo. What a morning, eh? Amen, amen. Well, it's been great to have you here at Community Church and so thankful for all those who uh, invest of their time and energy and the God-given gifts to lead us in worship this morning. I mean, we've got people working at Community Kids and in the cafe and as connectors and the worship tech team and the worship team up front. And then Pastor Tommy, thank you for bringing the word this morning. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, it's important to know how prayer plays into all of this, and your prayers are so critical. I think of Pastor Tommy and the CSM are going on a missions trip in late June, and even before that, Vacation Bible School is coming up, and that's such a critical moment in the lives of boys and girls, men and women who are invested in those opportunities of seeing God at work, and indeed, God is at work. And he works through people who live life with open hands. I think of Acts chapter 10 in a critical moment. A man named Cornelius, he was known as a man who was awe, in awe of God. He feared God. He was a man of prayer. He prayed often and he was generous, generous in giving of himself and of his resources to those around him. And in that moment, we see how God was at work in his life and in the lives of those immediately around him. And we can be that people who are living with open hands, uh, in awe of what God is doing, uh, praying and interceding, and then also being generous with all that God has granted to us. And so thank you for your faithfulness. And, and as you want to be involved more at Community Church, and point you to our website, communitychurch.com. Uh, community-church.com for information. You can stop by the desk out in the, uh, in the entryway uh, in the lobby for uh, what's happening, and that gives you an update on everything that's going on. And then I'd invite you to be a part of our Foundations Hour. It's actually only 45 minutes, but it'd be kind of weird to call it the Foundations 45 Minutes. So we just call it the Foundations Hour. That's at 10 o'clock. And during that time, we have some great groups going on right now. Uh, we've got uh, Treading Boldly in a, in a pornographic world. We've also got uh, Race and the Gospel, a discussion about that. And then also Starting Point. So if you're new to Community Church... It's your maybe within the past couple months or maybe it's your first week. Come on out next week, 10 o'clock in the family room just uh, to the left as you're exiting in the lobby area, and it's a great experience. But as we prepare to go out and we're uh, those people who are called to run the race, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, hear these words of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. His shalom. And all God's people said? 
Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week.